what we're going to talk about here, again, we'll talk about the scope of the problem with antiplatelet therapy. We'll talk about the pharmacology of different antiplatelet agents. We'll dus discuss uh, antiplatelet management guidelines for major medical societies and their limitations. <clears throat> and then we'll discuss thrombotic risks if we were to withdraw these agents. We'll discuss bleeding risks if we were to continue these agents during the perioperative period. And then what we're going to try to focus on is how do we develop a strategy that balances these risks, okay, and come up with an idea of the net benefit of our therapy. <coughs> All right, so, <coughs> excuse me, as I've mentioned to you, that one of the, one of the focuses or the major focus has been on the use of antiplatelet agents after percutaneous coronary intervention, PCI. And we know that the standard of care for patients who've undergone a PCI is to get dual antiplatelet therapy, dual antiplatelet therapy. And what I mean by dual antiplatelet therapy is aspirin plus another agent, and that other agent is an ADP receptor blocker. You guys are probably familiar, familiar with clopidogrel. Uh, that's Plavix, and there are a couple others, and I'll talk about them. Uh, there's Ticagrelor and Prasagrel. So th the standard is, is to put them on two of those agents, and then the amount of time depends upon the vulnerable period. Bare metal stent, four to six weeks, and drug eluting stent, the time period is one year. I put an asterisk there because some of the data more recently are really suggesting that the additional benefit after six months is not that great, but the, the current recommendation is one year. We also know that Many of these patients will come for non-cardiac surgery. So patients uh, who've had a PCI, about 4 and a, to 5% of those patients are going to come to surgery within a year. So within that vulnerable period, they're going to come for surgery. And we know that of those patients, 2% of them um, are going to have a, a cardiac complication, MI or cardiac death, within the first seven days of surgery, which is a 27-fold increase in risk compared to non-surgical patients in the same seven-day period. Okay? We also know that if you stop antiplatelet therapy uh, in patients who've had uh, recent PCI, you stop it prematurely, those patients are at increased risk of death and MI regardless of whether or not they're having surgery, so even in a non-surgical setting. So we know that premature withdrawal of antiplatelet therapy after a PCI is a bad thing. You already know that. You probably know, but maybe haven't paid as much attention to the fact that dual antiplatelet therapy is standard of care for other conditions, okay? And those other conditions are acute coronary syndromes, whether or not you've had a PCI. And if you've had acute coronary syndrome, you should be taking, again, dual antiplatelet therapy for a year. And there's more recent data suggesting that the same type of situation should exist in acute stroke, or TIA. All right, not standard yet, but there is more emerging data that dual antiplatelet therapy may be beneficial. And then in terms of antiplatelet monotherapy, <clears throat> many patients have indications for either aspirin or clopidogrel, mostly aspirin unless there's some allergy, in patients who have known cardiovascular disease and take it for secondary cardiovascular prevention. So stable coronary artery disease, stable cerebrovascular disease, stable peripheral vascular disease, and then we also have an indication for aspirin in patients who are taking it for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease who are at high risk. So all in all, about one-third of our adult patients have or are at risk for coronary disease and are potential candidates for antiplatelet therapy. Now, if you thought that the risk of stopping clopidogrel was only high after PCI, I hope this data will tell you something different, okay? On the left-hand side is a graphic which shows you events in patients who've had an acute coronary syndrome who are treated medically, and on the right, over here, are events in patients who've had an AC, acute coronary syndrome treated with PCI. On the y-axis is uh, MI or death per person day, per person per day, after stopping clopidogrel, okay? And what do you see? The risk is higher in patients who had an acute coronary syndrome and had their clopidogrel stopped than in patients who had an acute coronary syndrome and got treated with PCI and had their clopidogrel stopped. All right, so not just patients who've had a PCI are at risk if you stop their antiplatelet therapy. So, is antiplatelet therapy, is it a hero? Is it a villain? Well, it depends upon your perspective. If you're the cardiologist, it's a hero, right? Because you put people on antiplatelet therapy and it re reduces their risk of MI, it reduces their risk of cardiovascular death. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread, 
If you're a surgeon, it's the worst thing since I don't know what, because if you worry about it increasing your risk of bleeding. So is it one, is it the other? Well, maybe it's both, but what really matters is what is it to the patient? Okay, what is it to the patient? And what we're trying to do as practitioners is balance the risks of thrombosis and bleeding and come up with a, pl a treatment plan that optimizes outcome from the patient's perspective, not from our perspective. So let's talk a little bit about antiplatelet pharmacology. A couple platelets here in the endothelium, a little cartoon. The thing I want you to take away from this slide is hemostasis is a little complicated. Um, <laughs> There are lots of ways to activate platelets, okay, that the agents that are available out there are most commonly aspirin, which works here by inhibiting cyclooxygenase 1, and the ADP receptor blocker, P2Y12 receptor, there are many ADP receptors, which works here, blocks this. It's important to know about from the slide is, is both of these drugs inhibit platelets by inhibiting a feedback activation loop. They don't prevent platelets from being activated entirely. They prevent feedback activation through different mechanisms, all right? There's another agent on here, the GP2B3A blockers, like Reapro, uh, uh, those, uh, Integralin, those, those drugs are used in, in, in some settings in acute coronary syndromes with revascularization, uh, and those are a bit more potent. But uh, ADP receptor blockers and aspirin work through different mechanisms, but get you about the same level of antiplatelet effect when used singly. Now, there are three ADP receptor blockers on the market. You know about clopidogrel, right? Clopidogrel is Plavix, it's here. There's another drug uh, approved, Prasigrel, which is, goes under the trade name Effiant, and most recently, Ticagrelor, which goes under the name, trade name Brolinta. All these drugs work at the same receptor, but they're a bit different. Clopidogrel requires extensive metabolism to become active. It's a prodrug. Prasigrel is also a prodrug, requires metabolism, but less so. Both of those agents bind to the ADP receptor and block it permanently. Okay, so they don't come off the receptor, so the effect, once you've given the platelet that has been exposed to those agents, it's irreversibly blocked. Again, it doesn't mean it can't activate, it just means it can't activate through that mechanism. And then there's ticagrelor, which is an active drug. It doesn't require uh, any metabolism, and it is a reversible drug. So it's given a couple times a day, and if you uh, remove the effect, it uh, goes away uh, according to its pharmacokinetics. This is a table that shows the same type of data. So aspirin works by inhibiting COX-1. It doesn't require biotransformation. It is not reversible, okay, because it causes irreversible acetylation of COX-1. It's a moderate intensity effect. It works for the lifespan of the platelet. Functional recovery occurs, physiologic recovery occurs when you've produced more platelets. Now, you produce more platelets every day, about 10% or so of your population is turned over. So 10, 15%, in five to seven days, functionally, you're, you're fine. Clopidogrel, Prasigrel, okay, both of those are prodrugs. They require biotransformation. They have moderate, a little bit more effect for Prasigrel than for Clopidogrel, permanent effect. Similar to aspirin, because they're permanent, you have to generate more platelets to get rid of the effect. Five to seven days, five to seven days, the effect is gone physiologically. Even though there may be some platelets that are blocked, remaining around physiologically, the effect is gone. Ticagrelor doesn't require metabolism, another P2Y12 receptor blocker. Uh, it causes similar intensity to Prasigrel. Uh, it has a half-life of 7 to 12 hours. Its functional recovery is there after two days. And then there's Cangrelor. This is not an approved drug now. It is essentially a P2Y12 receptor blocker. It is an IV form, very short half-life. Uh, it's gone in, in, in a very short time, 30 minutes. Now, you can monitor the effect of platelet drugs using a number of tests, um, and people respond differently to them, all right? There's a phenomenon that's called resistance, drug resistance, or high on platelet reactivity. You can measure these things. Uh, certain states, uh, age, sex, uh, fe uh, women have a lesser response than do men. Uh, cardiovascular risk, risk factors will also diminish your effect. Uh, there are genetic polymorphisms that reduce the effect, particularly of clopidogrel. Um, the, but the importance of these things is not dramatic clinically, okay? At least not functionally now. And there are no recommendations that you should monitor these things, either for managing patients who require these drugs for an acute coronary syndrome. In fact, recent data published from the Arctic trial say that doesn't matter. Uh, or for trying to determine if someone's going to bleed from surgery. No data out there that says these are good tests 
to, uh, to predict who's going to bleed, uh, certainly in everybody. It's not, it's not worthwhile to do. There may be some subset. We can talk about that on uh, tomorrow more. Now, there are a number of societies, at least five, six, seven societies out there who have now given recommendations on what you should do with antiplatelet agents in the perioperative period. Okay, and I list them here, and there are their references there. You can go and look at them, and the nice thing is you can pick the recommendations that you like. <laughs> okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those in just a moment. What I already showed you here uh, is the data from the uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association. The focus is on PCI. Again, the focus is on avoiding surgery entirely during the vulnerable period. Uh, um, after the PCI, and that vulnerable period is either two weeks for a balloon angioplasty, it's four to six weeks after a bare metal stent, and it is uh, one year after drug eluding stent. And if you have to go to surgery before the vulnerable period is over, then the recommendation is continue the aspirin and the P2Y12 receptor blocker if feasible. All right? Now, as I said, you can pick the recommendations that you like. They're not all the same. And, and where is their consensus? The consensus is all of them pretty much agree you should assess thrombotic risk in your patients, okay? And they all pretty much agree that if you've had a PCI with a drug eluding stent, that's a high risk situation. What they don't agree on is how do you define low risk? How do you define moderate risk? How do you define high risk? And they don't also agree on what is the actual duration of this high risk period. For example, is it six months after a DAS or is it 12 months? Not defined entirely. They agree. They agree you should assess bleeding risk in your patients. And they all pretty much agree, if you look closely, that there are certain surgery that's high risk. CNS surgery, intraocular surgery, those are high risk surgical situations. They also agree that dental surgery, cataract surgery, skin surgery, those are low risk. Where they disagree on is how, again, do we define low, moderate, high risk? How do we deal with other surgical procedures that I didn't list there? They all will agree that uninterrupted aspirin treatment is reasonable for most surgical procedures. They agree with that. They don't dispute that it's reasonable. They don't dispute that it is reasonable to continue P2Y12 receptors during surgery in the high-risk period after PCI. No one disagrees. But then they also, don't, they also agree that withholding aspirin or a P2Y12 receptor blocker is also quite reasonable in a high-risk bleeding situation. Okay, so pretty much you can do what you like. And they also agree uh, that you should withhold P2Y12 receptor blockers, clopidogrel, five days before cardiac surgery. So we don't really know what we should do in the vast majority of our patients. We only have some clarity in, uh, in the minority. And if we are, one thing I should say is that if we are going to withhold these agents, the period of time in, in with which we hold them also is somewhat controversial. So again, what we want to do is balance these risks. We, want to, we, we know that if we withdraw the antiplatelet therapy, we will increase thrombotic risk. It's a fact. We also know that if we continue these agents, there is some increased risk of bleeding. That's also a fact, okay? But what we need to understand is what is the net benefit of our treatment plan? Is it consistent with the patient's perspective on risks, morbidity, et cetera? And oftentimes what we would want to go to in such a situation is a randomized clinical trial because those are the data that will give us the best objective assessment of the net risks and benefits of therapy. So what do the randomized clinical trials tell us? There actually are three trials, and I'll present those data for you, about aspirin therapy in non-cardiac surgery. So this is a trial, 20, 220 patients went non-cardiac surgery, mostly ortho, 30% urology, 25% abdominal surgery, 5% GYN. These are patients who have some cardiovascular risk, one or more risk factor. Some were on aspirin before surgery, some were not. Okay, so not, it's not the highest risk population but some cardiovascular risk. And what they did is they randomized them to either get aspirin or placebo for seven days before surgery and then three days postoperatively. And then after that, <clears throat> they, they would restart aspirin. Uh, in those patients who were on aspirin before surgery, they stopped it, you know, and gave them either this aspirin or placebo. And then four days afterwards, they would give those patients who were on aspirin, aspirin anyway, okay? So the outcome is major adverse cardiovascular events, and what do you see? In this group of 220 patients, 
the rate of reoperation, that's a serious complication of bleeding, the rate of reoperation was not statistically significantly different between those who had aspirin preoperatively and post-op and those that did not, although there was a trend towards more bleeding in the aspirin-treated group. In terms of major adverse cardiovascular events, there was a marked increase in number of events in those who got placebo. So no statistical difference in reoperation, a statistical improvement in cardiovascular outcome in those who got treated with aspirin. Trial number two, the Stratagem trial. Similar design. These are 290 patients. They're randomized to receive either aspirin or placebo. These were patients who had an indication for aspirin or clopidogrel before surgery. They were a little bit of higher risk population. <clears throat> um, so they all had to be an on an agent to start with. Uh, the strategy was a little bit different, though, is that they, 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 they gave them this aspirin for 10 days before surgery. Um, but then, in, in all patients, they got treated with aspirin after surgery anyway. So the, the only risk period really was this period before surgery and the 10 days before surgery. And then they looked at outcomes, death, thrombosis, and bleeding. And what you can see from the graphic here, there was no difference in any of the outcomes. No difference in bleeding, no difference in thrombosis, no bleeding in death, no difference in death. So no difference in that trial. <clears throat> and then the third trial, th this is a trial, the procedure is not surgery, but it's a very high risk bleeding situation, right? These, the trial here was done in patients who had acute upper GI bleeding. And they were all taking aspirin for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. All right, so they're bleeding, okay? They need an intervention. They're going to get endoscopy. And then after that, they randomized them to either continue aspirin for eight weeks or not, all right? Just get placebo. And then they looked at outcomes, bleeding and mortality. Okay, so if we look at that graphic, in terms of bleeding, again, there's no statistical difference in bleeding in the patients who got randomized to aspirin versus those who got placebo. But mortality, mortality was significantly higher in those who did not receive aspirin. Okay, so here's a question. I want you to show of hands. How many of you, how many of you stop aspirin routinely in patients who have GI bleeds who are taking aspirin for cardiovascular, secondary cardiovascular attention, prevention? How many routinely stop? Okay. Now, how many of you routinely tell your patients that if you do that, you'll decrease their risk of bleeding, maybe, but increase their risk of death? <laughs> okay. We have one honest person who tells their patient. I think. So what do we, what do we learn from these uh, trials? Well, we learn that we, if we interrupt aspirin, <clears throat> uh, or uninterrupted aspirin therapy is associated with um, net benefits in many, in many uh, procedures, but there is a non-significant trend towards more bleeding. And we have limitations in that we have relatively few patients studied. Um, we don't have all types of surgical procedures evaluated. We've only looked at aspirin, not all P2Y12 receptor, or P2Y12 receptor blockers. And so our risk estimates for thrombosis and bleeding are really quite imprecise. So can we be more precise on our risk estimates? How can we assess thrombotic risk a little bit better. Well, what we can do is we can go to the trials and try to extrapolate backwards. And so if we understand the indication for these agents, then we can understand what the benefit is in terms of thrombosis and preventing thrombosis. So what are the indications for aspirin? Well, primary prevention, there's an absolute risk reduction. Uh, it's modest. There's secondary cardiovascular protect, uh, protection, acute coronary syndromes, uh, those who have stable disease, acute stroke, uh, those who have stable cardiovascular disease and peripheral vascular disease. And if you extrapolate this out, what you get is indication on the, on the left here. On the right-hand side is the number of events, stroke, cardiovascular death, uh, or MI, per 1,000 patients per week if you were to withdraw the agent. And what you'll find out, not really surprisingly, in those acute situations, acute coronary syndromes or acute stroke, you have a lot of events if you... A lot of events will occur if you do not give these drugs, all right? Ten events per thousand patients, that's a, that's a huge number. Three events per thousand patients for acute stroke, that's a, that's a big number, okay? Then what you'll see in these patients who have stable disease, stable disease, you also have a tenfold reduction, but these are a substantive number of events. So I call them a moderate risk situation. And then the primary prevention situation, probably a very low risk situation. And we can do the same thing with P2Y12 receptor blockers. Again, the clopidogrels and their cousins. So we can take clopidogrel for secondary cardiovascular protection, just like aspirin in those who are people who are aspirin allergic. The risks are the same as aspirin. And then most patients take 
uh, these agents are doing so in combination with aspirin, and they're doing it for one of these indications, acute coronary syndromes with or without PCI, initial treatment after PCI, and prolonged therapy after PCI. And again, the risk estimates vary a bit uh, depending upon which clinical situation, but if you extrapolate them out, what you're going to find is, not surprisingly then, in those patients who are in the acute setting, right after an acute coronary syndrome with or without PCI, if you stop these agents, you're going to wind up with a lot of events. The same thing is true if you stop PCI with or without an AC, uh, acute coronary syndrome, a lot of events. You see them highlighted there in, uh, in, the, in, the, see, in, the, in the dark bold. Two and a half to seven and a half. And in those situations which you're subacute, so post acute coronary syndrome in the first 12 months, the event rate is lower. But I think what you might not realize is that this event rate, okay, 0.3 to 0.7 events, is higher than this event rate, is, is the DES, after, I mean, drug eluting stent in uh, between six and 12 months after therapy. And you might not also realize that in, if you take the bare metal stent patient, who is now out of that vulnerable period, that four to six weeks, their event rate is still pretty high here, 0.25. It's the same as this over here for the drug eluting stents. So these are moderate event rates. And in fact, I'll just go back and, and show you, those event rates are no different from these here in patients who have stable, stable cerebrovascular disease and stable coronary disease. And we're stopping those agents all the time. Okay, so the, the focus only on PCI is probably a little bit misguided. Now, those event rates, again, admittedly, these are extrapolation, you know, from one setting to another. They're not exactly precise, but they give you a general indication of the kind of event rates you're going to expect in terms of categorizing risk. But they don't take into account the perioperative period itself, which is a prothrombotic state, okay? You're going to increase platelet reactivity, procoagulant activity, et cetera, et cetera. So surgery itself may enhance the risk, even in, on top of withdrawing these agents. Well, let's assess bleeding risk now. We've done our best at trying to assess thrombotic risk. Can we assess bleeding risk? And if we're going to do this, we've got to be fair, okay? When we're talking about morbidity, what do we mean by bleeding morbidity? Is it any bleeding? I mean, what does that mean? So are you talking about more blood loss in a surgical canister? Are you talking about an increased need for transfusion? Are you talking an increased infection rate because transfusion is associated with infection? Are you talking about an increase in the reoperation rate? Are we talking about dying? Okay, any of these are morbid events, but they're not all the same. And are we talking about a high or a low risk bleeding procedure? And you can categorize your surgical procedures like this. I already told you, high risk, we all agree. Intracranial surgery, intraspinal surgery, a little bit of blood in a closed space, really bad thing, okay? Really bad to the patient. Urologic surgery, maybe if you're working on the bladder, because if you're working on the bladder, there's a lot of antifibrinolytics there. It's hard to stop bleeding, but is that quite the same as having blood inside your head? Maybe not, but that might be in the higher risk. Then there's moderate risk procedures where blood loss is high, known to be high. There are low risk procedures where blood loss is, blood loss is low to moderate. Again, you see the characterization there, orthopedic surgery, peripheral vascular, abdominal surgery, many surgeries, probably most surgeries fall in these categories. Not all, but most of them. And then there's minimal risk surgery. And here's a table which shows the data from observational trials about the relationship between aspirin and bleeding risk. In green means that you're okay, it's a green zone. In red means there's some danger. The, Types of procedures are on the left-hand column. Across the top, you're seeing different types of morbidity based upon low risk, which I'm going to say just having more blood loss, that's a low morbid event. Who cares if you have more blood in the canister? The patient couldn't care less. Moderate risk, let's call transfusion a moderate risk event. I mean, we don't know all the risks, but it's moderate, certainly in comparison to a reoperation, which is a high-risk event, or death, high-risk event. And what you'll see, there's a lot of green on that chart meaning that you're in the green zone when it comes to high-risk events. There really are no surgical procedures that suggest there's a high morbid event that's going to occur by continuing aspirin, except, except in neurologic surgery where there are case reports. They're really, the, the worst that you get is maybe more, more blood loss and transfusion in some types of surgical procedures, but even in others, there's really almost no risk whatsoever in terms of quantifying this in a meaningful way. And indeed, if you look at cardiac surgery, there's actually, if you look at those patients who got aspirin before surgery compared to those who didn't get aspirin in the five days before surgery, they actually survive better. 
despite whatever more bleeding there might have been, the survival is better uh, if you give people aspirin before cardiac surgery. Now, what about aspirin plus clopidogrel? Okay, so now we don't have as much data. Most of the data come from cardiac surgery where there is plenty of experience. And what we know is that if you have patients on both of these agents, as many of them are before cardiac surgery, for, particularly for coronary artery bypass grafting, that you're going to increase the uh, transfusion rate substantively, about twofold, but that translates into a lot of patients because a lot of patients get transfused in cardiac surgery. And you also, importantly, increase the reoperation rate substantively fivefold, which tra translates into a lot of reoperations in cardiac surgery. Risk of death, not statistically different. And the risk of infection is also increased. Uh, what you can see here is there's a, about a 50 percent increase hazard ratio of 1.43. Uh, if you continue clopidogrel versus not continue with clopidogrel in patients who undergo cardiac surgery. Other types of surgical procedures, so these are the data that are out there, observational trials, looking at bleeding morbidity as a function of the type of surgery on the left-hand side and the, the uh, morbidity of event, again, blood loss, transfusion, reop, or death. You'll still see a lot of green on this chart. Okay? There isn't a lot of high morbidity events that are reported in these populations, although, again, the literature isn't complete, except for um, in, in cardiac surgery, as I already mentioned to you, where the reoperation rate we know is high. We know that you can get more blood loss and uh, transfusion in some procedures, but in many procedures, like hip and thoracic surgery, what's reported is there really is no substantive effect. Even if you include both of these agents compared to the patients who aren't on both of these agents, uh, there isn't that much of an effect. I love this cartoon. So here it says, uh, you see the OR table, the surgeon is being masked. He says he can't stand the sight of blood. And I, I once asked m one of my surgical colleagues who I, I respect, I, I asked him, well, why is it that, you know, surgeons are so willing to stop antiplatelet agents or antithrombotic agents in general? He says, well, you know what? If I operate on the patient, the patient bleeds to death, that's my fault. But if I stop their aspirin and they have a heart attack and die, that's an act of God. And, and so if that is your mentality, understandable, then perhaps it shades how you're going to tra uh, uh, choose your, uh, your treatment plan. So I think it's important as we try to think about the net benefit of antiplatelet therapies to try to compare apples with apples so that we understand from the patient's perspective what is it that they would want. We know that if we withdraw antiplatelet therapies, we'll increase the risk for thrombosis. We know that if we continue the antiplatelet therapy, we'll increase the risk of bleeding. But are the events equivalent? All right? So from the patient's perspective, MI, stroke and death, high morbid events, perhaps equivalent to reoperation and death, but certainly not the same as allogeneic transfusion or a wound hematoma, right? I mean, people agree, disagree with that? Yeah. So, well, let's compare apples to apples here. And then let's try to balance them. What, we've, what we see here is that if we compare apples to apples, we know that if we stop these events, we're going to have 0.03, point, stop antiplatelet therapy is somewhere between 0.03 to 10 high morbidity events per thousand per week, depending upon the clinical indication. Com compare them to reoperation, which we know from an from a antithrombotic point of view, Aspirin doesn't cause these things in anybody, except for maybe patients who are going CNS surgery. And the only place where we know that colopidogrel is causing these things, uh, in addition, uh, presumably, to a CNS surgery, is in cardiac surgery, where we have a lot of reops. Again, the impact of aspirin, essentially, on morbidity and bleeding morbidity is low. Clopidogrel with aspirin, we think it's moderate to high in cardiac surgery, but in other surgery we're not certain about. So how should we approach this? Well, the strategy needs to be if our bleeding risk from these agents exceeds the thrombotic risk, we should stop them, right? If our thrombotic risk from these agents exceeds the bleeding risk, then we should continue them. And the way we're going to come to an understanding of what the real risk is, is we have to talk to each other as colleagues, surgeons, anesthesiologists, cardiologists, the primary care doc, and involve the patient, say, hey, lay Mrs. Jones, if we do this procedure on you and we stop your antiplatelet therapy, your risk of having an MI is X. Your risk of stroking is Y. Okay? Your risk of bleeding is Z. And when I mean by bleeding, I mean, what do I mean by bleeding? I mean dying from bleeding? I mean having a transfusion? That has to be specified before we just say, stop 10 days before surgery. Oopsie. So 
I leave you with a couple of charts here about how you might approach this given the different types of clinical situations and the type of morbidity. Again, when the risk of bleeding exceeds thrombosis, you want to stop it. This is a chart for aspirin, and what you can see here is in red is the caution. That's where you want to stop. Pretty much the only time you see red here is in primary prevention. So in those patients who take aspirin as a primary prophylactic, you can stop it because the risk of thrombosis is low. And in those patients who are undergoing neurosurgery, you pretty much have to stop aspirin, even though the risk of thrombosis may be high, because who the heck wants to die of a hemorrhage in their brain? I mean, so you have no choice there. But pretty much everybody in between, the risk of thrombosis exceeds the risk of, uh, of bleeding in, in the vast majority of cases. It's a little bit trickier with P2Y12 receptor blockers. Uh, again, this is in combination with aspirin therapy, so you would still continue the aspirin. We're talking about discontinuing just the P2Y receptor blocker. So again, primary prevention, you'd stop it. CNS surgery, certainly you would stop this agent uh, along with the aspirin. Now you're in other conditions where maybe after six months of clopidogrel in a high-risk situation such as ACS or PCI, if you're in a high-bleeding risk situation, well, maybe it's reasonable to stop the clopidogrel. We know that it's certainly important to stop the clopidogrel for cardiac surgery because the morbidity is high. But in other situations, you may find yourself in a reasonable condition of continuing the aspirin, uh, the aspirin and the clopidogrel. Can you bridge these agents? Or is there another agent I can use to bridge from my clopidogrel to something else? Well, there are no randomized controlled trials, no data. I can tell you that you should not use non-steroidals. They are not the same. They don't work the same way. And in fact, the data say that patients who are non-steroidals have a higher cardiovascular risk than those who don't. So do not use them as a bridge. You may have another reason to use non-steroidals, but it's not a bridge for aspirin or clopidogrel. You can, there are reports of people who are at high risk of thrombosis that get off these other agents, get put on a 2B3 antagonist as a strategy, you know, there's just case reports. There's a lot of risk associated with this. These agents tend to cause you to bleed more. It's expensive. I mean, I'm not advocating that. I'm just letting you know that there are some case reports. And then there's a the question of could you use IV cangrelor to bridge? That was, uh, there was a trial done in cardiac surgery. That didn't show any benefit or any harm, but it wasn't necessarily successful. And then ticagrelor, which is the oral agent. Again, there's no data that says that that's worthwhile to do. So then, in summary, how should we manage this? Well, we have to assess thrombotic and bleeding risk for each patient individually. It's not easy, but you got to do it. We need to understand that acute coronary syndromes and PCI are both high thrombotic risk situations, not just PCI. Thrombotic risk decreases the more remote you get from the time of the procedure, right, or your, your event, your PCI or your acute coronary syndrome. And generally, by six months after your event, you're in the moderate category. Bleeding risk is going to vary based upon the surgical procedure, and we already went through that. If we discontinue antiplatelet agents, we need to do so only if the net benefit is unfavorable, right? That these are going to cause bleeding from the patient's perspective. And if you're going to stop aspirin or clopidogrel, aspirin five to seven days uh, is fine. Same with the clopidogrel, ticagrelor only needs a couple days. And then again here, strategies for managing aspirin into P2I, which are receptor blockers. And critical is communication among your care providers. All get on the same page. Talk to your patient. Really dissect these risks. And don't do anything knee-jerk in these.